uh, as enemies. Apparently prompted by Rhodes' hardline stance, officials outlaw Monday's scheduled rally. A reporter asked Governor Rhodes on May the 3rd what his definition was of a rally, and he said two students walking together. The easygoing rapport between students and guardsmen transforms as darkness falls. It seemed so casual. At night, it turned ugly, very ugly. Sunday night, students demonstrate in the streets just off campus. Hundreds block traffic by staging a sit-in. As police, National Guard, and state troopers face off against the students, helicopters circle overhead. The guardsmen fire tear gas, then physically herd the students back onto campus. The next day, Monday, May 4th, a rally is to be held in defiance of the ban on campus protests. News crews and dozens of still photographers are there. They sense something is going to happen. Around noon, the bell at the south end of the commons rings. The violence of the preceding days has changed everything. Instead of a few hundred students, thousands show up, many of them just to watch. The students completely surround the commons and a by now exhausted National Guard. Many of the guardsmen have come to Kent straight from another tense deployment. The previous week, Rhodes had called in the guard to escort truck convoys and protect trucking terminals when a Teamsters strike threatened to erupt into violence. The situation at Kent State allows no time for rest or recuperation. I was totally tired. I was exhausted. I was on duty until 5 o'clock that morning. My men were on duty until 5 o'clock that morning. But the officers have their orders. The students are to be prevented from demonstrating. Yet at first, the guard does nothing. The guardsmen seem to allow the initial speeches to go on, but somewhere along the line, there came a point where they decided we're going to you know, put an end to this, and we're going to disperse the students. After about 15 minutes, the guard has had enough. And the order came down to lock and load, fix bayonets, and uh, prepare to use gas. Uh, place gas masks on your head. Um, I issued that order to my men. This is the guard's commanding general, Robert Canterbury. He has only recently arrived and is still wearing his business suit. You have your weapons in the ready position. The troops are told to load live ammunition. This is out of the ordinary. Most of the time, soldiers wear their ammunition clips on their uniform which constitutes a clear show of force. Intimidation is a, is a clip attached to your shirt in, in plain sight. That's intimidation. That's intimidation. When you see that brass on that bullet and the point of that bullet shining in the sunlight, that's intimidation. Lock and load is beyond intimidation. The guardsmen are now prepared for battle weapons fully loaded with live ammunition. The orders are then given. The Ohio National Guard marches out onto the commons and into history. This program is brought to you by Chase. You want to make the most of your money. That's our priority, too. Chase, what matters? Visit chase.com slash matters. You're right. We need a new TV. I want it all. I want it all. I want it all. And I want it now. Text Chase for your credit card balance and decide what to spend in seconds. It's perfect. Real-time info matters. 
Chase what matters. I was pretty nervous, uh, apprehensive. Uh... It was tough to tell him I was joining the Army at first. I uh, did research on my own, tried to get an idea about what the Army was going to be like. It's given me a whole bunch of confidence. But no, I'm, I'm very proud of it. He's just a stronger, more driven individual. He can outrun me. <laughs> if your son or daughter wants to talk about joining the Army, listen, you made them strong. We'll make them Army strong. Find out more at GoArmy.com. Honey, are you going to keep that thing above your head the whole vacation? Yeah. I booked our package on Orbitz. I got this great hotel. I saved a ton. Well, you're embarrassing me. When I get back from aerobics, I like it gone. It's not too late to get away this winter. With the Orbit 7-day sale, you'll save $50 off your next vacation. Save now at Orbitz.com. Red Bull Flu Tag. To enter your human powered flying machine, go to RedBullUSA.com. No matter how demanding my workout is, I'm not done until I finish it with EAS Myoplex. Taken within 30 minutes after my workout, the high quality protein in Myoplex helps me refuel and build lean muscle. That way, I don't waste my workout. Now I'm done. Grab your EAS Myoplex at a leading retailer near you, or for your free sample, go to EAS.com. 7-Up has 100% natural flavors for naturally better taste. And who can resist that? 7-Up, uh. with 100% natural flavors. Tonight, about a third of the building has been blown away. They were convicted of committing one of the worst terrorist attacks on this country, the Oklahoma City bombing. But some claim Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols didn't act alone. Tim McVeigh had no experience that would equip him to engineer such a successful bomb. What critical piece of evidence did the FBI overlook? Does it embarrass the FBI? You bet. The final report, Oklahoma City bombing, tonight at 9 Eastern on National Geographic. Just past noon, hundreds of students at Kent State University squared off against a detachment of armed National Guard troops. The protesters were determined to exercise their right to protest against the Vietnam War. To break up the illegal student rally, the Guard first used tear gas. But as this film footage shows, a strong wind made the gas canisters no more than playthings for some of the students. It didn't have much impact. In fact, it probably emboldened them some. And uh, they started to throw them back, a few of them. As the tear gas dissipated, around 100 guardsmen were marched out towards the students. Students aren't going to argue with guys with bayonets and guns and bullets, they'll decide, <laughs> I'm getting out of here. The troops headed up Blanket Hill, pushing the protesters back. In this photograph, one of the protesters is Allison Krauss. She will be killed when the guard opens fire. By now, the rally has been all but dispersed. Yet an officer orders the troops to continue over and down the hill, away from Taylor Hall. They march another 200 yards and find themselves in an awkward, if not dangerous, situation. The guardsmen are now on the practice football field, with students in front of them and a fence to the side. I never felt trapped in, in the sense, but there certainly was probably the heaviest barrage of rocks and stuff. We were kind of sitting ducks at that point, but uh, it wasn't that we, we entrapped ourselves or felt that we had done that. 
troop discipline begins to splinter. A few guardsmen break ranks to throw tear gas canisters back at the students. At the back of the field, the officers meet to determine their next move. General Canterbury can be seen at the center of the group. What I've believed is that down on the practice field, they decided that they would go up to the top of the hill and when they got there, they would teach these demonstrators a lesson. The following photographs capture the sequence of events. The guardsmen realign and head from the practice field back up Blanket Hill. The students cheer, assuming the maneuver is a retreat. It seemed to embolden them that we were retreating them. And they, they started to close in, yes. They, they started to yell a chant of kill, kill, kill. I can remember that chant. Kill, kill, kill. I'm convinced that if, if the students had decided to rush the guard, they could overrun us. But many believe this photo proves the students hardly posed a serious threat. In just seconds, the guard will turn and fire in the direction of the photographer. The guardsmen were outnumbered, heavily outnumbered, but the students were entirely outgunned. When the troops reach the top of Blanket Hill, all hell breaks loose. When the guardsmen turned and took aim, they were in a small open area next to Taylor Hall. All the shots were fired in a narrow range towards Prentice Hall parking lot. The four dead students, Jeffrey Miller, Allison Krauss, William Schroeder, and Sandra Scheuer, were between 88 and 130 yards away. This grainy 8 millimeter film is the only known footage showing both the actual firing and the reaction of the crowd. The film was taken from a dormitory window several hundred yards away. The guardsmen are barely visible at the top of the hill, though faint puffs of smoke can be seen as the firing commences. Because of the poor quality, the film does nothing to clarify exactly what transpired. Numerous eyewitnesses, however, claim the guardsmen turned in unison. They turned and they were firing. There was no hesitation. Uh, between, it was almost like this quick movement where they stopped, turned, and fired. The guard turned and had fired towards the group. I saw guys turn in unison, lower their weapons, and start firing. This photograph was taken just before the shooting began. General Canterbury and Lieutenant Colonel Charles Fassinger can be seen behind the firing line. If there wasn't an order to fire, or an agreement to fire when they got to a certain location, how do you account for those guardsmen turning together in unison? Some guard officers claimed they heard a shot. Instinct took over. That was why the troops turned around and opened fire. That sound I heard, and I characterized only it was different. Could it have been a shot? Absolutely. I don't know where the shot came from. All I know is I looked the same way the troops did. Suspicion regarding this first shot soon fell on two different men. This guardsman is Sergeant Myron Pryor. He appears to be firing a 45 caliber handgun. I could see the shells hitting the sunlight, you know, the, the, brass, the brass coming out of the, the receiver, who, you know, in court testimony said he was just pretending he was firing the 45. I mean, come on. The visual evidence, however, is inconclusive. Pryor himself always insisted he never fired his sidearm. I don't think he fired at all. He'd been around a long time, and he's the last guy in the world I could picture ever doing that. The other potential shooter was this man, a freelance photographer and alleged FBI informant, Terry Norman. Norman was involved in one of the most bizarre moments of the day. Joe Butano and his cameraman, George Gomez, were in the right place at the right time to capture it. Here, a graduate student named Harold Reed can be seen chasing Terry Norman towards the safety of the National Guard lines. Camera and sound are rolling as Norman takes out a handgun and gives it to a police officer. 
who will later give it to KSU police detective Tom Kelly. Guy tried to kill me. Yeah, yeah. No doubt. The guy, guy tried to beat me up, man. Tried to drag guy. My camera light hit me in the face. Tom Kelly asked for the gun, and that's when he opened it up, and he said there's four shots fired. Now, I saw the empty cases, but George was shooting something else. Unfortunately, cameraman George Gomez had moved away, and this crucial exchange was not captured on film. In his official statement, Kelly claimed the gun had not been fired. But Joe Butano still says otherwise. Tom Kelly told us the gun was fired. And according to Butano, Terry Norman confirmed it. We had asked him then, Terry, why did you fire your gun? And he says, I had to. They were beating on me. And I says, you did shoot it four times then. He says, yes, I did. Butano's account has been corroborated by at least one other person. But a presidential commission on campus unrest concluded that the guardsmen were the only ones to have fired a weapon. When this program contacted Norman for an interview, he refused. Still, the central question remains. Was there an official order to fire? Did anyone order them to fire, or did they just start shooting? They were not ordered to fire. Each soldier fired when he thought that his life was in danger. I believe it's perfectly normal for a man to have the right to protect his own life. There are not hordes of students ready to overrun the National Guard uh, who ultimately settled on that as one of their, as their reason for shooting. I mean, my God, the closest student that was making any kind of gesture toward them was Joseph Lewis, who was standing there uh, giving them the finger. I know that there was no reason for them to shoot me. I was silent and I was motionless. I was standing still and there was no way they were under any threat from the students present. The chaotic aftermath can be seen in this rare home movie film. Joe Butano says it was given to his crew on the day of the shooting by an unknown student. In the midst of the commotion, the guardsmen formed up and were redeployed at the edge of the commons. Stay back here. Guys weren't talking. We weren't talking. I think we were stunned at what did happen, what some of us saw. But shock would soon turn to anger on both sides. Students enraged over the shootings, defiantly reassembled in the commons. The National Guard commander, General Robert Canterbury, was not going to let that happen. He was determined to clear the area. Tomorrow, for two hours, the human race will simply disappear. This is what will happen minutes, days, and centuries later. Dogs go wild. Satellites fall. Monuments tumble. The human world is breaking down. This is the Earth we'll never see. Aftermath, Population Zero, tomorrow at 9 Eastern on Nat Geo. When Rick comes home, we're going to buy our first house. But we're not wasting any time searching for our perfect place. Now's a great time to buy a home. No matter where you are in the world, Remax can help you find your perfect place. Visit Remax.com today. The following is rated SX. Viewer discretion advised. Roden Track says, a welcome alternative to all those Civics, Corollas, and Sentries. Motor Trend says, Suzuki is hot and has no plans of cooling down. CarAndDriver.com calls it the cure for the common Corolla. The all-new Suzuki SX4 Sport. Now playing at your local Suzuki dealer. It's going to be a great ride. Get the SX4 Sport for just $14,395. See your Suzuki dealer for additional savings. Steve O'Dell is a real Geico customer, not a paid celebrity. So to help tell his story, we hired a celebrity. Recently, my father was carjacked at knife point. Oh, honey, that's all right. This face has seen more knives than a Benihana. Geico handled the whole thing with unbelievable sensitivity. Sensitivity? I can't feel my face. 
I was so impressed, I switched to GEICO and saved over $600. I was very happy. GEICO. Real service, real savings. Am I smiling? I can't tell, Steve. I can't. 50's the new 40. <laughs> Let's get real. What should never grow old are your dreams. And for that, you don't need a nip and a tuck. You need a plan. Find out why more people come to Ameriprise for financial planning than any other company. I wish I loved my job. Did somebody say wish? Star above, grant this wish I'm thinking of. With a heart full of hope, oh star I'm calling up. <laughs> America's favorite home gym is more affordable than ever. Now you can get the all-new Bowflex Extreme for just $19 a month. Call the number on your screen for a free DVD or video and check it out. Bowflex's power rod technology delivers results. Powerful arms, defined legs, a stronger chest, and a toned, sexy core. And owning a Bowflex home gym is so affordable. Great results are easy with a new Extreme. All it takes is one simple workout, 20 minutes a day, three times a week, to get in the best shape of your life. The Extreme is built so well that we back it with an unrivaled seven-year warranty. And so effective, it comes with Bowflex's 100% satisfaction guarantee. Own the Extreme with no money down, and payments are just $19 a month. And when you call right now, we'll give you the leg attachment upgrade free. Call for a free DVD or order your Bowflex Extreme for only $19 a month. And for a limited time, get the leg attachment free. Meet Marshall Brain, expert explainer. And I'm really curious about everything. Thursday, we're going to break apart golf balls. Titleists will show us their secret recipe. Who knew boats could get so much speed from fiberglass shot out of a gun? Who knew? With Marshall Brain, part of Engineering Thursdays, premieres this Thursday at 9 Eastern on Nat Geo. May 4th, 1970. Just minutes after 13 students at Kent State University were shot by members of the Ohio National Guard. The field known as the Commons again separates the two sides. The guard now standing by the burned out ROTC building. The students assembling on a slope near the Freedom Bell. There was horror and there was sadness. But there was a feeling of revenge there that surfaced. The guard, led by General Robert Canterbury, prepares to disperse the students a second time, despite the violence that has just erupted. Here, Canterbury is confronted by a Kent State professor. Well, listen, you've got to stop this. This is turning into a slaughter. Well, you seem to be unmoved by it. It's a terrible thing. These are, high, these are college kids. Look, this is a problem. Listen, I, you know, I was in the military. I know about this killing stuff. Canterbury, in general, was an aggressive guy. If he weren't, he wouldn't have been there uh, out on the hill. That's not typical. Another professor, Glenn Frank, makes one final effort to defuse the situation. Sir, they will not, do and they will not make damage. any trouble. You can... We have no options. Sir, you've got a couple hundred students there who might get hurt. Are you, are you can we try to move them out first? Can we try to move them out? Will you give us a chance? How long will you give us? We've got five minutes. Soon after, Frank uses a bullhorn to address the crowd. Please listen to me right now. Wait a minute, quiet a minute. Hold on! I am begging you right now. If you don't disperse right now, they're going to move in, and it can only be a slaughter. Jesus Christ, I don't want to be a part of this. Please, I'm begging you also, follow me off this way. Glenn Frank made us realize that it was a bad situation, that if we didn't leave, that we might be shot. Reluctantly, the students leave the commons. Further catastrophe is averted. By the next day, the campus was all but deserted. But the storm surrounding Kent State was just beginning. The shooting threatened to split the country in half. Many felt the students deserved what they got. 
I was sitting at the kitchen table and my father came in the back door and he looked across the room and saw me sitting there and with his hand still on the doorknob, he says to me, um, they should have shot all of them. And I said to him, well, don't you know then that one of those people would have been me? And he just walked into his office in the back, which was down the back hall. Didn't say anything else. On the other side of the political spectrum, the outrage over the shootings inspired more protests across the country. What it did was bring the nation's attention to how our youth had fallen into the line of fire. That somehow uh, we'd gotten to such an extreme point that angry youth were an enemy category. That very attitude nearly paid off for Governor Rhodes. On the day of the shootings, he was trailing his opponent in the Republican Senate race by seven points. He lost the next day's primary, but only by a single point. Rhodes never voiced any regrets about sending the National Guard to Kent State, and most of Ohio's voters apparently never blamed him for the tragedy. After a four-year hiatus due to term limits, he would be elected governor again in 1974 and 1978. It seemed that Rhodes knew his constituency. Promoting law and order worked. And perhaps that was the problem. This was not good law enforcement. This was politics. They handled it in more of a political way than a law enforcement way. That's why it happened. Because of his injuries, Dean Kaler will be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. The four students who died are memorialized where they fell. And each year, a candlelight vigil is held on the Kent State campus. It is a poignant reminder of the lives lost and the scars that remain. Nothing that took place on the campus between May 1st and May 4th necessitated the use of lethal violence against unarmed civilians. I can say this as a participant and less as a historian. It's a sickening feeling to lie there prone, having been shot already, and to have gunshots going off over your head, not having any idea how long that gunfire is going to last, and have no way of defending yourself. The fundamental role of a democracy is to control the amount of police force that's used. And uh, what happened was an inappropriate and very unfair uh, use of force against uh, protesting students. Eight of the National Guardsmen, including Matthew McManus, were later indicted for violating the students' civil rights. None of those charged were officers. The accused soldiers were ultimately acquitted in both criminal and civil court. Still, for Matthew McManus, the situation was inexcusable. In the end, it was emotions, I believe, that took command. I want people to, to know in their heart of hearts that, that the guardsmen suffered, not as much as some, but we've suffered, and that we're deeply regretful of what took place. We may never know exactly what prompted the National Guard to open fire at Kent State. After so many years, a definitive answer could not, of course, bring back the dead. But it might all... Diamond, that money back to those men. All right. I'll let them win it back. Come on, Marty, you in? All right, yeah, I'm in. Well, let's see. Oh, Lee's got a pair of aces. Whoa! And three tens here. What have I got? Four, five, seven, nine. Uh, well, I'll just bet it all. Too rich for my blood. 
I'll leave the light on for you, Dad. <laughs> How are you holding up? Is that spider still around? Oh. I think he's realized he's more afraid of me than I am of him. He's not in his corner.